once again, I'd like to welcome everybody here to the Buffalo History Channel. This is going to be a very special episode. Tonight, we're going to do a special history and deep dive into the Downtown Stadium Project. I am joined today, I have the pleasure to be joined by the one and only Mighty Oba, Pat Freeman. Radio radio and TV legend in the Buffalo area. He too is the soul of Buffalo TV. Yes, he <laughs> is. Yes, he is. He's been in the media game a very long time. And um, he has been on a crusade these past several years to make uh, to bring back a, the Buffalo Bills Stadium into the city of Buffalo. You we know back in 1973 in left the city of Buffalo right there on Jefferson Avenue at War Memorial Stadium. Now it, now it's where it's now at in Orchard Park. It's, it's been Rich Stadium. It's now Highmark Stadium. So uh, we're going to go into a, it's going to be a deep dive. And we're also going to start off with going into some of the history of the stadiums as well as the downtown stadium project. Okay, so uh, first off, Mighty Obi. Welcome to the Buffalo History Channel. Welcome back to the Buffalo History Channel. Oh, thanks for having me, Doug. It's an honor and a pleasure to be on the Buffalo History Channel once again with the great Doug Ruffin. Yes, sir. We also congratulations on your recent award. Thank uh, you. Being named as Man of the Year for the Emoja Foundation. Uh, Well-deserved honor. Absolutely. I'd like to send a thank you and a shout out to... Uh, Emmanuel and Samuel Radford for selecting me as the man of the year, as well as uh, send a shout out and much respect to the memory of Brother William Peoples, who was the creator yes, of Umoja Incorporated and the Man of the Year Award. Thank you very much. It, is, it was truly, truly an honor. Now, Pat, also, yes, by sir. the way, I'm wearing, y'all know, I'm see, I'm wearing a Pat Freeman and I are both fellow Bennett, Bennett alum. Tom, Bennett alum. Bennett alum. They're on their Bennett way to titles. the States again. Yes, they <laughs> are. Yes, yeah. they are. I've been seeing that. I've been seeing that. So let's get start, you know, from the beginning. You know, this is the Buffalo History Channel. And, and we, so we always, our cornerstone certainly is history. So Pat, to the best of your ability, can you give us a history of the uh, stadiums in Buffalo with... Uh, War Memorial Stadium and um, not what is now Highmark Stadium. Right. Yeah. The, the Buffalo Bills, when they started uh, here in the Buffalo, West New York area, uh, first called home uh, War Memorial Stadium, which was located at Jefferson and Bess in uh, the Dodge Street area. And, you know, it was it, it was an older stadium. Obviously, uh, they knew uh, after they won two AFL titles in a row, uh, 1964 and 65, prior to the Super Bowl, uh, that they would be uh, needing a new stadium. So they formed a committee uh, that started looking at various sites. And myself and Chris Stevenson looked up that information down at the Erie County Library. And uh, George K. Arthur, the late George K. Arthur was on uh, that particular committee. And they had distinguished a number of sites in the city of Buffalo. Now, can you believe at one time, as you know, Buffalo has always had aspirations of having a major league baseball franchise, that they were looking into building a new dome football stadium along with a dome uh, baseball state in downtown Buffalo. Uh, but those plans, I have them here, uh, were never brought into fruition. There was some corruption. Uh, things went sour. They were talking about uh, moving to Lancaster at one time. That didn't work out. They looked at a Cheektowaga site, which is really not a bad site at all near the airport. And they ended up settling on uh, Orchard Park after all of this uh, corruption, people went to jail. Uh, there was a lot of controversy with it. And they ended up uh, settling on a in-ground design, uh, 
uh, what they used to call Rich Stadium, which is now Highmark Stadium, was opened in 1973. And that stadium is 50 feet below ground. And those stadiums usually last 10 to 20 years max. Uh, we've been in that stadium over 50 years. Uh, it's had uh, two, reno two, two major renovations. And uh, there are several things wrong with that facility because it is 50 feet below ground. Uh, the foundation is shifting each and every day. And so uh, it got to the point uh, from my viewpoint in 1998, I started a campaign on the radio, uh, Mix 1080 AM WFO, uh, which I was the sports director for 25 years. I started a campaign uh, for a downtown stadium in 1998. And I continued uh, that campaign until the present day. Uh, but once I realized they weren't doing what they were supposed to do, uh, to bring a stadium into a downtown urban area, uh, I really uh, just started making occasional commentaries and the big push. Uh, we had a big push in 2012 uh, with George Haziotis and Nick Strasick and the Greater Buffalo Sports Entertainment Complex who brought in HKS Incorporated. And they were going to build a stadium with private money on the waterfront. I remember that. All they needed was the land. They never got the land. Uh, private interest groups uh, worked against that project, and that project uh, basically was killed. And here you are today. Uh, there was a late effort to build a new stadium in downtown Buffalo, uh, but that effort came uh, way too late. We lost our leverage uh, with the professional franchise and now they are settling on building a one-trick pony stadium across the street, uh, which is just going to continue uh, the status quo, uh, which only helps the owner of the franchise. Now, I can remember back around 2012, I, was, I started w walking around with you and documenting your crusade to bring this downtown stadium into reality and what was the response from the community? Oh, it was exceptional. It's a great response um, inside the city and outside the city because what we were uh, recommending was a year round facility which would raise uh, revenue year round. Whereas the facility in Orchard Park, including this new one is a very limited um, you know, proposal in which it doesn't have a roof on it. It's built in an area uh, that is a economic desert and it doesn't have the hotels or any of the infrastructure uh, for it to be a year round facility, even if they put a roof on it. So we were looking at doing something that would curb of the necessity of such a heavy outlay of public money. Uh, that was met by a, a cross-section of appeals uh, from a lot of people, because as you know, New York is one of the highest tax states oh, yeah. in the country. And we were trying to uh, build a stadium with private money in which it would produce year-round revenue similar uh, to what they are what they have done in Minnesota, what they've done uh, in uh, Indianapolis, and now what they're proposing to do in Nashville, Tennessee. And unfortunately, our leadership here, and there's plenty of blame to go around, just did not do the things necessary uh, to bring this into fruition. And we were gonna connect the rapid transit system uh, with the stadium to eliminate a lot of the traffic. The traffic in Orchard Park is the second worst uh, in the NFL. And we were going to do a lot of things uh, that would benefit the entire Western New York region with this plan. And HKS uh, put together the renderings and a uh, state-of-the-art design 
Uh, but all they needed was the land. And if they got the land, they were ready to go, an option to develop that land. Uh, and we would be talking differently here today in 2022. I can remember looking at the um, artist rendering of that project, of that proposed downtown stadium. And I was, I was taken aback by it. And, you know, and then to think about where you were going to place it, I mean, the area was, to me, was, was ripe for it. And, right. and, and considering even today, with the, the success of the Bills organization, when you look at the ownership, when you look at the, the changes that was made in the front office, of course, the success on, on the field, as well as, you know, the, the support that it gets, the support that it gets now with the Bills fans, or as we call them, the Bills Mafia. I mean, it seems to me that the season would be completely appropriate for having a downtown stadium in the city of Buffalo with with Buffalo basically with a lot of different things. With Buffalo getting Buffalo's more in the public eye now, getting put on the map. People people know more about Buffalo today. So the season would be absolutely appropriate to have something like that right there in the city of Buffalo. Absolutely. Um it, it, it's a travesty. This will go down as another lost opportunity for Western New York. Uh, we have some very poor decisions being made that don't encompass the will of the people and what's in their best interest. So they started a rationale of this will keep the team here. and uh, They were going to leave unless we got a stadium deal done. You knew they knew this back in 2012. The problem is they didn't do anything uh, to prepare for where we are today. Uh, Atlanta put together a tremendous multi use facility that is used year round in the heart of Atlanta, and it benefits the entire region, not just the Atlanta Falcons, but the entire region. They have a world-class soccer team that plays there. They have the SEC tournament, NCAAs. They have a year-round uh, group of events that are there all the time. That is exactly what we were planning uh, for Buffalo, New York. Yeah, the but because, because they did nothing. You're going to get a one-trick pony stadium, and the only beneficiary of that is the owners of the franchise. That's it. Oh, but you get to stick your chest out and say, this is my team. So all I want is to keep my team here. And th that's all you're going to get. You get to watch TV. You get to say you're a Bills fan. But where's the residual economic revenue that comes to our community? You're not going to get any. The revenue that we used to get from War Memorial Stadium, we were the ones that used to park their cars. We were the ones that used to make uh, the sandwiches and lunches for them uh, prior to the game. We were the ones that uh, helped them uh, get their spirits and whatnot on before the game. It was in our community. Those were the original now, tailgate parties. Yes, sir. But now, 92% uh, <laughs> of Orchard Park is, is made up of white Americans are white people. There are no people of color out there, very few. So they're the ones that get the residual economic benefits. Their restaurants, their businesses get the residual economic effects of this team. Whereas us in the city of Buffalo get absolutely nothing, nothing. No residual economic benefits whatsoever, other than what is uh, spread across the board from payroll tax, some, some extra airlines coming in. But our community itself, we get nothing. And there's nothing that anyone could tell me otherwise that you could explain this to me. And why does this have to be in Western New York? And it's always like that. And it's been that way since 1973 when they moved that stadium out to Orchard Park and took away whatever residual economic benefits our community was getting. That multi-use stadium could have solved so many economic problems 
that it it could have it could have been a game changer. I mean, right? Those are. I mean, I used to look at this what what they what they've built in the other cities. Just imagine that being in Buff that that would that would just boost Buffalo so much. You and know, with, and Doug, with living we wage living wage jobs. Remember, Doug, we were proposing a complex, new convention center, yes. hotel, retail space, right next retractable to roof stadium, year-round revenue, a state-of-the-art North American athletic museum funded by Strong Museum out of Rochester. Right they were on, on board with us. Now you, you're going to put forth another calamity in Orchard Park, and the only argument they can make. The only argument they can make is the team will be here for the not too near distant future, at least for the next 30 years. That's what you're telling me? So 30 years of no more residual economic benefits for our community. There are no black vendors out there. I've been looking for them. There's not one black vendor that you can name in Orchard Park. But I'm a vendor in Atlanta. Huh? Huh? People, I've been trying to tell people that. I I have a food truck in Atlanta. I'm selling them at Mercedes-Benz Stadium for every game, for every event. But where, where are the black food trucks? I don't know of none. I don't know of any business that is benefiting from this facility. And nobody says anything because they don't want to offend the powers that be. That is the problem with this place. If we we become subservient to the very people that are keeping us within the reins of economic segregation. And that is a problem. Yep. Now I can remember um you I remember taking a when I was helping you cover when I was covering a lot of that, documenting that your effort um I can vividly remember taking a picture of you at this um, community community meeting that they had, and um, and you had uh, you had you had how many signatures did you get again? Over three thousand. Over three thousand. You had over three thousand signatures, and you had you had the hand you were hand. I took a picture of you handing it to a gentleman in the midst of this meeting. Can you take us back to what that that whole meeting was about? Yeah, they had four public meetings on uh, what what to do with the waterfront. And uh, during those meetings, we were coming 40, 50 deep united for the stadium for each meeting. And they knew it. They were uh, basically trying to shut us down, shut us out. So at one meeting, I decided to give... Uh, a copy of the petitions to Brian Higgins, uh, the congressman from this area. And I gave a copy to the then president of the Erie Canal Harbor Development Corporation. And uh, it was over 3,000 signatures for a downtown stadium. They knew we had uh, incredible support. But then they got to uh, the third meeting and they decided that we're not going to talk about the stadium anymore in this setting. And they basically took us off the agenda and there was no other reason for us to come because they didn't want us there because we were bringing 40, 50 people deep on one subject. And we all supported a downtown stadium. And they made sure that we were silenced and they put forth the agenda that they already had in their coffers. And they have done that successfully, excluding our community from uh, almost every turn of participation. And that has been the way of Western New York. I mean, we've made a lot of headways here. I mean, you've got Mayor Brown, you've got uh, Majority Leader uh, Crystal Peoples, you've got April Baskin, the chairperson of the Erie County uh, Legislature. Uh, we've made a lot of political inroads here, but it seems that we are still fighting the same, same battles at every turn, no matter how much more representation we get. And it's just, it's not like, it, it, don't get me wrong, you have battles all over the country. But it's funny 
that you can go to different parts of the country and you see more of us participating in the process on an economic level that we don't see here on any level whatsoever. We get very little, if any, residual economic benefits from that stadium in Orchard Park. Very few of us can even get out to Orchard Park. And when you, when you make a plan for a stadium of this nature, you have two very key agreements that are gonna come along, your project labor agreement and your community benefit agreement. And I'm telling you at every turn, they are you don't hear them saying, what is the goal of 10,000, uh, a 10,000 person labor force? How many women and, and people of color should be in that labor force? Minnesota came out in front and said 30%. We're gonna go for 30%. And when they finish, they finished at 35%. When have they ever announced uh, the labor goals of any of the renovations of that stadium? Not in 1998, not in 2012, because they don't want you to know that you have basically been excluded from living wage opportunities. And I guarantee you again, they will uh, fail uh, to bring about living wage opportunities on a fair level to people of color in Western New York, unless we get on our job. Now, when you looked at some of the other stadiums that were built in some of the other cities, I'm just curious to know, were they aware of what you were trying to do? Or did they, did they lend any kind of uh, letters of support or moral support? Yeah, we, we had a lot of support from around the country. Um, People thought we were doing a great thing. The people that fought against us were right here. That's the sad thing. That's the sad thing. The people right here did everything in their power to make sure that they sabotaged a private investment proposal. Yeah, the You're man was willing to... to put his own money up. I remember, I remember yeah. him saying that. Yeah, he was willing to put up his own money and the rest was going to come from sponsors and investors. Right. And now you are about to get hit uh, with the realities of the NFL business model. The NFL business model is for the taxpayer to pay for it, and, and I'll use it for free. You know, they're not going to pay any rent here. And they'll have it on paper they're paying rent, but they're not paying rent. Mm. And they've also hidden uh, the subsidy in this agreement because we made such a stink about the subsidy before. And uh, so did uh, Investigative Post and some of the other independent uh, media people. Uh, they, you know, they basically talked about the subsidy and the subsidy is still there. You know, they're just not uh, making it readily available for you to dig through, but I'm sure uh, once the final agreement is put on paper, we'll be able to find it and show you just how much you're really paying uh, for an organization to make billions of dollars all on your back. And this is a taxpayer uh, funded facility that only benefits the ownership uh, group uh, that owns uh, the franchise here. And you're not going to get any benefits from this. You get some payroll taxes and you get to stick your chest out and say you're a Bills fan, and that's about it. But as far as a benefit, you're not included in that. If you look at look at all the hype before the Bills season, restaurants right. saying they got to, we got to order extra chicken wings and we got to order this. Where it's was the black? Did you see one black restaurant? Huh? No. <laughs> they were they were all out in Orchard Park. You know, I mean, the reality is this this is what you call segregated economics. You get to pick and choose as of who benefits from a team receiving public money. It's absolutely ludicrous. And, and what gets me is that your leadership is not publicly vocal against this. I'm not saying they're not vocal against it or they're not speaking up against it but they're not publicly 
calling press conferences in front of camera, telling these people we're not going to accept this anymore. That's my biggest problem. Everybody wants to do this closed door policy stuff. Come on, let's just be honest. Why can't everybody, if you're going to take public money, why can't Doug Ruffin benefit from it? He's paying money. I'm paying money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, our community deserves a equal part in the process. Absolutely. Why aren't our, uh, do you know of any ads at UFO that's ever played uh, telling you to buy tickets for the Buffalo Bills? No. Any ads in the Challenger, the Criterion? No. But they spend money marketing their franchise all over Western New York, but they don't include accredited media uh, media outlets of color. That's the problem. This is a one-sided area, and you make it so difficult for people of color to get a, a, a honest piece of a pie that you're taking part of it to build this entity so this franchise can function, you're taking a huge public outlay from us too. But our restaurants are benefiting. If you would have put that stadium in downtown Buffalo, it would have been, been inclusive of this entire community. But by putting it in a population area that is 92% European, those are the people that are going to benefit. And it runs right, at, is it an accident? It runs right into South Buffalo, which is mostly European? I mean, come no, on, man. I can see from what I can see. <laughs> when, when, when does it start? When, when does everybody recognize ain't but one race on this earth, and that's the human race? We're right. all separated by culture, geography, ritual, beliefs, right. what have you. But we're all in this thing together. And the thing about it is that they're taking the public money from all of us together. But the benefit from this is, is segregated. And that is unacceptable. And I, I, I just get perturbed yeah. at the lack of public outcry. We, we even let groups tell us who's important in our community. Yeah, you know, and and that's sick. That's really sick in the head for some outsider to tell you who's important in a community of color. That tells you that they they are in total control of your thought processes, totally. And with this thing with the stadium, this is one of the worst worst deals I've seen. And I'm I'm tired of arguing. With saying, you know, I was arguing with people, calling them by name and everything. Yeah, else. I, I, re I remember. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. I, I really am. I'm hey, sticking with the facts and the facts only. Hey, you know, you know, I, I, <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean uh -huh. to anybody. I'm trying to be a nice guy, but facts are the facts. Right. And we, as a community, I am an African that lives in Western New York. I've covered this franchise for 28 years. I've covered 22 Super Bowls. How many people can say that? Yet I get no benefit whatsoever of this franchise being in Western New York, nor does my community, nor does the media outlet that I represent. The oldest African-American newspaper in Western New York does not get one ad mm. from this franchise. The Challenger Community News does not get one ad from this franchise. WUFO, you can give it uh, all, all the awards, whatever you want to give them, but not one ad from this franchise. That is unacceptable. And you don't get to take over a billion dollars of public money and there not be some parameters on who benefits from that. 
You're going to make billions and millions of dollars off of this deal. You're going to have total control of a stadium built with public money. Yet the public, a huge portion of the public that gave you money to build this facility gets absolutely nothing. That is ludicrous. It is unacceptable. And I don't know what kind of leadership we have in front of us that will accept that type of madness. And that's something that could really, as great as Buffalo is trying to get out here and be, this is this could be the main thing that that puts you that just it could be this could be your biggest game changer. It could be right great. right in front of you. And they're gonna, man, I'm telling you, this is one of the worst deals. So could you just well, just one, uh, once again, what was what was the de- what was the ultimate deal that was made? Because I know I've been going from book before. So what was the deal that was basically agreed upon? This deal, uh, the ownership group, based on their own in-house study, which I've only seen parts of it, mm-hmm. stated that it was in their best benefit to build in Orchard Park. They felt that it would cost more money to build in the city, which it probably would. I don't disagree with that. But the difference is, if you build an Orchard Park, it's cheaper, right? So this is going to be a brand new stadium. This is going to be like, it's not going to be the same. It's going to be a brand new stadium in Orchard Park. Across the street. Yes. Across the street. what, What the question is, let's say the stadium in Orchard Park they, they've got it estimated it's going to cost $1.4 billion. Mm-hmm. Let's say the stadium in Buffalo is going to cost you $2.5 billion. The stadium in Buffalo should have been a dome, and it would be used year-round, and when it would produce year-round revenue. The stadium in Orchard Park will be used 10 to 15 times a year and will not produce year-round revenue. That's the biggest difference. It won't create jobs. It won't produce hotels around it unless the Pagulas have a private plan in place that they're going to develop that area. Now, that's a a possibility, too, because a lot of owners are doing that. After they get their stadium deal, they basically do a deal to get the surrounding land, and then they develop further that area to their benefit. They create um, an attraction built around the Buffalo Bills so they can make money year round. So they can benefit from it year round, but not the entire region. And that's where the mistake is. You're not going to get the Frozen Four. You're not going to get the NCAAs. You're not going to be in the race. This is going to be one of the first new stadiums that won't have any consideration for a Super Bowl whatsoever. One of the first. And that is a scary, scary tale. But we have leadership here that stick their chests out telling people this is a good deal. It's not a good deal. Who's it a good deal for? The ownership group. Your taxes, you're gonna have, you're gonna get some residual taxes from uh, their payroll. You're gonna get more flights in. There's no question about that. People travel more to the games, having a uh, NFL franchise in town, you're going to get some hotels, but it's all, it's going to be uh, crumbs compared to what you would have gotten by putting a uh, multi-use uh, sports complex in downtown Buffalo. This is going to go down as a huge error, huge error. And I, it just befuddles me right. that we have people that won't say a thing. And they know they blew this deal. They should have, I wrote a letter. I think I put it on, on my Facebook page the other day. I wrote a letter to Ralph Wilson in 2012. Okay. Now, I didn't get an answer from him because, you know, his health was failing. Right. But I asked him and I put forth this plan to build a new stadium after they got the deal done for the renovation of what you call today Highmark Stadium. It became New Era Field, whatever. Now it's Highmark. But I put forth in a letter to him 
pleading with him to look at building a downtown stadium that would produce more revenue for him, produce more revenue for the NFL, produce more revenue for this region year round. I never got an answer. I don't even know if he even saw the letter. I don't even know if they even let it. I wrote that same letter to the Pagulas. Now, I had a one on one uh, with Miss P- Miss Kim Pagula at training camp in 2019. And I will say this she did put me in touch uh, with Mr. Shocklin, who's no longer with the organization. When he left the organization, that was the end of my contact with them. But she was receptive. But now, you know, she's not well. We wish her the best. We hope she has a speedy and positive recovery. Mm-hmm. And we 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 put out positive vibes for her family uh, during this difficult time for them as she has been sick for a number of months. But she was receptive then. Then the pandemic came. It kind of took away two years of planning. And then after the pandemic, they basically demanded a new stadium and we wanted an Orchard Park. And then this new group emerged and they did some good things, but it was too late. They should have joined us in 2012, Doug. And you know there wasn't, you know, we had a lot of uh, people saying we were doing the right thing. Right. I Uh, I remember. We got a lot of publicity. Uh, We spoke before the Erie County Legislature. Uh, We went before the Common Council a few times. But people should have really, really put forth the effort for this struggle and put a lot of pressure on people to do the right thing. But on somewhere along the line, a decision was made that we're not going to do nothing unless we have to. That was the worst mistake. I don't know who in leadership made it. I can guess, but, you know, I don't feel like arguing with people anymore. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. But somewhere along the line, we, someone in leadership made a decision that if they're not asking for nothing, I'm not going to do that. We'll just let it go until they're ready to talk. Oh, we'll, we'll put forth, let's renovate the stadium one more time. Well, they said, you ain't renovating nothing. This stadium is in bad shape. You either give us a new stadium or we're moving. That's what it came to. It did not have to get to that, Doug. No, it didn't. And that's why you're in the scenario that you're in. And they can put forth the their only argument they can make. We had to do this to keep the team here. There were a lot of cities that were coming after our team, but we saved it for you with another bad deal that's going to haunt us for another 30 years. When this deal is done, I will be 89 years old. And I don't know, I'm not in charge of my future. I don't know if my future is tomorrow. True. But I do know I tried my very best. Did I make mistakes? Probably so. You fought the good fight. But I fought as hard as I could to get people to understand the importance that of this uh, project being in downtown Buffalo could have been a generational game changer. And for that, I've, I, I even got accused of taking money. People said I was under the employ of HKS and Nick Strasick. I never received a dime. All of the work I did was on behalf of this community. And for that, I have rarely gotten any credit. I had people uh, on Facebook the other day saying, I don't know if anybody ever fought for a stadium. So they inboxed me 
and I gave him some of the some of the work that you've done, and you did a heck of a lot of work, brother. Heck of a lot of work. Yeah, hey, tried to do what I can for you, man. You know, I, I was you still, I was in support of the project. Yeah, and because you know history, you know how much it would have benefited everybody, right. and that's that's what people don't get here. Segregated economics has to come to an end when you're using public money. If it's segregated, if, if segregated economics is the outcome, that means that deal should have never been made. But see, they can say now, well, it's the only thing we could do to save the team. And, and that's wrong. Right. Wow. A missed opportunity. Indeed. Yep. And well, around the country, you, you have black vendors, you have uh, people that are getting uh, residual economic benefits from a, uh, a franchise. They offer none here. They don't even want to give us a commercial. Nothing. Wow. I was with Sheila Brown every year when she put forth a proposal and it would be shot down by the franchise every year. They're saying, oh, we're done spending money. Like it's a joke. You're not done taking public money. You're taking public money every time you open your doors. And that's the problem. These are, they allow NFL franchise, NFL franchise who receives this amount of public money to operate should not be allowed to continue to practice segregated economics. And this franchise, can you name one person of color in their front office? There are none. Our, I tell you what, your leaders whisper about it, but they don't talk about it in public. Why? Because they don't want to piss off the powers it be. And I was taught, I was raised that if you tell the truth, let the truth stand on its own. You're not hiring people of color. You don't have any, any people of color that are vendors at that stadium. They're all of one persuasion. But you're not taking you're not, you can't tell me it's just European people that are paying to keep this stadium up. You can't say that. Are they the only ones buying tickets? No. Every time I look around, I see Norm on their commercials. You know what I'm saying? That's the chefs, if you don't know it. But I but they can use our likeness. But how much are we making as vendors? are uh, participating in the economic process of having an NFL franchise. None. And you don't force your leaders, you don't you don't back your leaders into standing up for you. You don't read the criterion. You don't read the challenges. You look at the pictures, but you don't read the articles. We've been crying the same thing for 23 years. And somewhere along the line, we have to look in the mirror as a community. Did we fight hard enough for this? Did you stand with Doug and me and Chris, the late Chris Stevenson for this? This will go down as one of the worst blunders alongside Putting UB in Amherst campus, right? Oh boy, That's UB should have been in downtown Buffalo, just like the medical campus is now. Don't forget the rapid transit. And the rapid transit has never expanded, never. Our plan included the rapid transit, not this plan. This plan is an extension of the worst traffic problems in the NFL. Not the worst, second worst. I think the worst is D.C. I'm pretty sure Washington is still number one. 
I think we're yeah. tied with New England. All suburban states. You know, all mm -hmm. suburban states. Right. And the, the part of it that will continue is economic segregation. You know, I applaud uh, Erie County Chairperson April Baskin. She has fought her heart out. But there's not enough unity no, it isn't. backing these things to get them done. Not the right way. They give us crumbs. We'll get some crumbs and be happy. Yeah. And that's the sad thing. Yeah. Well, wait, wait until they start asking for the seat licenses. Now you, that's when you're going to see people freak out. Oh yeah. Because they're going to say we have to sell a certain number of seat licenses so this whole deal will work. That's what they did before. The last time it was we have to sell a certain number of suites for the money to be released to build the stadium or renovate the stadium. That's what they did. So they had Doug Flutie and Jim Kelly and all of them going around trying to sell suites. I would assume they're going to do the same thing with these seat licenses as soon as they get past this last bit of uh, paperwork. But this is a travesty. I, I just have come to the conclusion I'm going to be nice to everybody, but I'm going to tell the truth. But this is a terrible deal. I don't agree with any stadium being built in Orchard Park, and I think uh, they made up their mind they were going to do this uh, prior to the pandemic because uh, the county and the state uh, didn't do their due diligence on a city site. You can't wait to the last minute on a city site. And the county and the state are, are, are virtual landlords in agreement uh, with this franchise. And I'm not naming any person in particular, but the bottom line is the city and the county and the state should have done more due diligence and done more work to make a deal that would benefit their entire constituency instead of uh, just part of their constituency with the continuation of segregated economics. And that's what we're seeing with this deal. Yeah. Well, Pat, it has been a, a the, the, all, all I can say is the struggle continues, right? Always. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Buffalo History Channel. We've been planning to do this for quite a quite some time and we finally got a chance to do it i want to let the audience know that this isn't this will not be our first deep dive our next deep dive will be will apply to an interview that he that he did a while back with street legend sly green so we'll i look forward to it absolutely absolutely it's been a pleasure to have you on the buffalo history channel all right douglas my man. Oh, all right, Patrick. My man. Person of the year, Doug Ruffin. Hey. Tell your dad it was, it was a pleasure to see him. Uh, I hadn't seen him in a long time. Yes, absolutely. And my best to the family. And thank you and everybody for your kind words at the event as well. Always a pleasure, brother. All right. Take care. Take care.